It's Tuesday afternoon at 4 p.m. in Switzerland, and it's Space Cafe Web Talk time. Our Space Cafe Web Talk 33 minutes with Jose Ashash will begin soon. Thank you for joining us today for our talk about cyber threats in space, why commercial actors should be concerned. As always, we appreciate your participation and ongoing feedback. That is very valuable for us and help us to improve. I'm Torsten Kreening, your host today and publisher of SpaceWatch.Global. We are a Switzerland-based online platform for information in and about space and new space activities in a geopolitical context. I know many of you are already familiar with our website, our bi-weekly and daily newsletters, and the Space Cafe podcasts. And if you have an abo on our podcast, then you have seen our latest episode, number 23, was released this, mo uh, released this morning featured um, Professor Pascal Ehrenfreund, and she talked about astrobiology, something really to check out. We also keep our fan shop open online for you to support us active, actively and become a space watcher. Edition one has cool items for you, your friends, and the ones you love. Your support is needed to keep our work alive, and we do that for you. If you have missed any of the previous web talks, we have an archive available on our website in the events section and on YouTube. We host our Space Cafe web talks live weekly. This Space Cafe is already the 49th edition today. With that, I'm super excited today to have, in my opinion, one of the key persons in the Swiss space industry are today with us. Somebody who I see as a great ambassador for space and beyond. And with that, a warm welcome, Jose Ashash. Thank now, you, Torsten. Nice. Now, now mastering also um, the hopefully correct pronunciation of your surname. But with that, we leave it. Um, let me tell our audience a bit about you. Jose is the founder and the CEO of Alten, um, Switzerland or a Geneva based um, space and security company. He is the managing director of AP Swiss, a joint program of ESER and the Swiss Space Office, and an advisor and chairman of several startups. startups. And I hope I, I keep most of them here because among them there are SISEC, uh, Media Lario, Astrocast, Nilto Pharma, and Dot Photon, ranging from satellite manufacturing, IoT, cybersecurity to biomedicine, and I'm quite sure you will talk about it later on a bit. So they started his career as a professor of geophys geophysics and moved on to become the deputy director general of the space, uh, the French space agency CNES, become the director of Earth observation programs at the European Space Agency and the first se secretary general of the group on Earth observations. He is also an architect of the Copernicus, Copernicus program God, of the European Union and its Sentinel series of satellites. Jose is graduated of uh, a, he is a graduate of the Ecole Normale Supérieure in Paris, holds a PhD in geophysics, a PhD in physical science, and was a postdoctoral fellow at Stanford. With this impressive short bio. I'm happy to have you here with us today, Jose. Let's kick it off. Um, giving your outstanding background, we talked about what I've just talked about and the various initiatives and companies you are involved. Can you give us please a quick overview of our current trends that you see in the space industry? Well, thank you, Torsten, for the introduction. And uh, indeed, uh, today the trends I see are essentially three. The first one is constellations. Everybody's talking about telecommunication constellation, first of all. There's the high end part of it, the Starlink from SpaceX, but also Lightspeed from Telesat, which was just uh, 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 approved uh, uh, last month. There's going to be one web in Europe. There might be more. And there's the low end. Um, 
to some extent, I'm already involved in many of these, and I'll come back to it because through some subsystems. But uh, and there's the low end of constellations in telecommunications, which is IoT, and of course uh, through Astrocast, this is exactly what we're designing: a global uh, constellation for connecting small objects with uh, short messages. So telecommunication constellation. There's also now constellation in Earth observation, which are beginning to emerge, but it is less, it's a bit more complicated. Second trend, which is covering everything, is optical systems. We're moving from really uh, from radio waves to optical systems, at, first of all, in, in telecommunication. So most of these uh, telecommunication constellations I've mentioned are now using optical, uh, free space optical communication because it provides much broader bands and also much better cyber security. We'll, we'll come to this uh, uh, later in the discussion. Um, and through Medellario, we are building, uh, we're working on optics for the terminals on this constellation. So that's another interesting entry point uh, for me in the uh, in this trend. But uh, optical systems are also redeveloping for what they've been initially developed for, which is Earth observation. And we see more and more uh, Earth observation systems, which are more capable. Media Law is also involved in, in these, but uh, now the problem with Earth observation and with these constellations, which want to do real time, which want to do video, is the amount of data. And hence the next step, which comes with optical system and optical communication and optical observations is compression. And this is what uh, we're achieving with, uh, with Dot Photon, uh, another company I'm involved uh, in, which, uh, which is doing uh, lossless compression of, uh, of images taken from space and, and elsewhere. So that's the second trend, optical systems and presumably optical system will will develop further, we'll see more and more optronics uh, developing on satellites. And finally, the third one in which I'm less involved is, but still I recognize as an interesting trend is in orbit reconfiguration, but to the broadest possible sense, which means reconfiguration of satellites. I mean, programmable satellites, reprogrammable satellites, onboard processing, but also in terms of deployment. My, my vision today is that, I mean, we used to send satellites on an orbit and they would stay in this orbit, but now we do more and more think in terms of maneuvering. We think of missions where satellites will change orbit, will move from one orbit to another, um, possibly at the end, of course, at the end of the mission, they will have to deorbit to reduce the number of uh, debris in space. Uh, and the, so maneuvering and uh, programmable satellites, what I call reconfiguration in orbit is, uh, is obviously the, the, the new trend. So constellations, optical systems, orbit in orbit reconfiguration. These are for me the three main trends uh, that I see in, at least in the uh, commercial space. Okay. Oh, um, I mean, all of these trends are would give us room for really dive deep into that. And you even haven't spoken about AI here and um, all of these applications, but I think that's what you cover in the well. It's in, it's, in orbit. it's embedded. It's yeah, okay. embedded in optical systems and in in many things. Maneuvering requires uh, AI, but of course, image processing and yeah. onboard processing is based on AI. Uh, lossless compression is is an entry point to AI, so AI is absolutely fundamental. But that's not specific to space. I mean, tell me of one area which is not uh, taking AI as the main train today. That's right. That's right. <laughs> point well taken. All that sounds for me super exciting. But I mean, our as our title suggests, there are more than just challenges, there are also threats, cyber threats to be more precise. How real are they? And who are these hackers, if we still might to call them? I mean, I think when we were young, many decades ago, we have seen 
war games and whatever, where a few kids could hex a Pentagon and make big things. But movies, essentially movies, movies yeah. yes, <laughs> but good yeah. movies. <laughs> yeah. Well, you know, uh, we are putting more and more value in space uh, by creating these infrastructures, but but also because the in these infrastructures are the basis for new and extremely valuable businesses. So when you talk in talking about value, you're talking about attack, attacks, it comes with it. And of course, there's the security and defense dimension, which adds to it. So physical attacks on satellites is a reality. I mean, it's even been physically demonstrated by the Chinese who demonstrated an anti-satellite weapon and destroyed an old satellite. So we all know that this threat exists, it's physical attacks. There's a second type of attack, which, we'd be, which has been illustrated, which I would call the mixed attack, which is half physical, half cyber, and which is illustrated by this uh, Russian satellite uh, called, uh, what's, what was his name? Uh, Lush Olamp. Who, who, which, which started flying nearby a French-Italian telecommunication security satellite, and no one knew exactly what he was doing. But there was maneuvering to come close, and then something happened. So this is a mixed physical and cyber attack. So you were asking, who are the, the threats? In the first case, it was China. This one is Russia. Uh, and now we, you can think of virtual attacks of any scale. And there it can be, again, governments fighting against other governments or trying to reduce the, uh, the capabilities of others, but it can be small hackers. I mean, as we'll discuss further, I mean, any qualified uh, IT uh, computer science specialist can become a hacker because there are plenty of uh, entry points on satellite systems. And there you can do, you can be a competitor, uh, you can be a bad guy trying to do ransomware, uh, or you can be a, a political uh, force uh, or a military force really uh, trying to achieve something. And something can be what? It can be destruction of the satellite, it can be the stealing of data, because as I said, if there are, if there's, uh, valuable uh, hardware in space, presumably there's gonna be valuable data on the satellites or tra transiting through the satellites. And of course, denial of services. I mean, this old classical attack that we see on earth on most system, which is just den denial of service and then ransomware. This is something you can do on, on today. It's been done on hospitals because everybody is interested in uh, medical data, but the moment uh, space data will, uh, will have value, we can see uh, I mean, those uh, denial of services attacks on satellites uh, very um, coming up and coming up from any source. Can, can you please uh, evaluate or elaborate a bit more on these potential risks of, of cyber threats in, in space or broader term on space objects. So, or, um, I mean, it's, it, I think it does not have to be in, in space. And I mean, coming back to where our title came from, why should commercial actors should be concerned here? Well, essentially uh, the risk is, uh, is twofold. I mean, is, there are two categories of risk, I would say. And again, it's just the, the one I mentioned. The first one is, uh, is destruction of your infrastructure. You're losing your satellite, you're losing your constellation. And, um, and this actually can be even more detrimental than simply using one satellite because, uh, I mean, by creating debris, once we start launching constellations, if you uh, create debris by destroying one satellite, by construction, these debris will be in the orbit of the other satellites of the same constellation, and you can enter into a self-accelerating uh, mechanism called the Kessler syndrome. So that's the main, I mean, I would say that's the number one uh, threat. Uh, but the other uh, risk is, is and more important in the future is really the denial of services, disruption of services. And this is true for 
any service that is being provided from space. Actually, Galileo was initiated by Europeans because of precisely there was a risk of a voluntary denial of service on GPS by the owners of GPS. So this, this was a different, it's a different story, but that's the reason initially why the European developed uh, Galileo. And um, all these GPS, Galileo, GLONASS, uh, Baidu systems, they provide navigation, positioning, and timing services, which are extremely important and which, uh, which are used in everyday business. So if you create a denial of service on any of the systems, then you're disrupting a major uh, chunk of uh, the global economy. So that's, that's huge. Now in telecommunication, whether it's global internet, the Starlink and, uh, and, and others, or if, even in IoT, if you, 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 you stop the communication, you stop the business, and, and therefore, uh, again, denial of service uh, for uh, ransomware attack is um, is the main is the main risk for commercial operators. And then in the third domain of uh, applications of space, which is intelligence, essentially based on observations, then depending on what your intelligence is being used for then again, you're disrupting something. So if it's military intelligence, then you're, you're making the defenses of a country weaker. If it's environmental intelligence, which is what we designed Copernicus for, uh, which is a tool to help us understand uh, global phenomena, uh, global warming, uh, biodiversity changing, natural disasters. Well, if we lose this ability to understand if we lose our intelligence capability on the environment, then our ability to, uh, to manage the environment is reduced. So again, uh, denial of services uh, implying a reduction of efficiency. And then of course, there are commercial services like precision farming, um, uh, uh, poachers, uh, poachers, um, trafficking, animal trafficking, which is being now more and more monitored by satellites. If, uh, if you can disrupt the system, then uh, again, you can, uh, you, uh, you free the, uh, you stop the surveillance, you stop the, you remove the intelligence and uh, you weaken the, uh, the defenses. Of course, supply chain is the same. There's more and more uh, space components or space services being used for supply chain management, disrupting supply chain on a global basis would be extremely disruptive for the uh, for the economy. So the, the risk is there. The risk is in we we sometimes we don't realize how much we rely on space for our infrastructure and our information on a daily basis. And if if there is a threat, a cyber threat on satellite uh, system, then uh, we, uh, we, we may lose some of these uh, capabilities and this could be uh, could have huge de detrimental uh, consequences. Let me give you an example. Let's, let's project in two or three years ahead of us. We'll have those very powerful uh, internet constellation providing broadband communication to mobile in real time. Starlink, Lightspeed, OneWeb, the European one. You, you Autonomous two vehicles. Years. Just to be sure, <laughs> there's a European one in, in two years. Um, I, no, I want well, to pop in here. Okay. <laughs> okay, well, Starlink is already uh, uh, right. offering, um, uh, I mean, looking for early customers, uh, uh, beta version or alpha version customers. Uh, OneWeb will gonna come later, Lightspeed, is uh, will be launched pretty soon, and um, the uh, so the car industry obviously will rely on them for autonomous vehicles because the key the key problem with autonomous vehicle is continuous connectivity, and the only way you can produce totally continuous connectivity is even even not sure with five G will be with so with satellite connectivity, and so uh, obviously uh, this constellation will play a role in the in the future autonomous vehicles. So if you start having autonomous vehicle 
circulating on, I mean, you, by using information which comes from space, denial of service would uh, would be be would immediately create a major disaster. That's why European car in the European car industry is uh, is actually reacting and pushing for a European constellation because obviously Tesla will rely on Starlink as an obvious affiliation. But uh, I guess Volkswagen and uh, and um, uh, all the German uh, German car companies will be willing to rely on something more European, if not more German, uh, uh, for this. But uh, but again, this is typically the kind of threat that uh, a cyber attack on this future infrastructure will uh, will uh, look like. I would like to stick or on on that on that topic or for a bit longer. I, we have two questions that fit in perfectly, but when you s talked about uh, the the physical attack, so uh, I, I can take an our satellite out of its orbit and um, move it from from A to B, so then I do have to have an access to to his TCNC system. So rather than to his data links or um, I mean, as far as I know, I mean, these are very, very highly protected uh, communication channels or at, at all. I don't say it, they are not hackable, but it's a different system than the normal data thing. And I mean, just picking up the, the uh, question of, of, of Christian, I mean, data stealing is one thing to take over data, but data manipulation, the, the, the integrity of, of, of manipulating or the integrity of data, manipulating data. Uh, how do you evaluate these threats from their likelihood? Plus, last one, as Ronald or, or put in, that the due to the speed of Leos and their, their, their orbits, they are hard to hack because the availability is just, or as he says here, uh, seven to 10, 10 minutes. And I mean, Ronald was with, with, with Leo Sat for quite some time, or so I think they evaluated or on that. So just to okay on on integrity. Uh, well, actually, it depends who is the uh, who is the attacker, uh, because the denial of service is something fairly obvious when you know that it happens and mm -hmm. you can react. It's painful. It can be it's lethal, but at least you know you're being attacked. In in spoofing, in data integrity, on in data manipulation, it's uh, it's completely different because you don't know what happened. And there have been a number of examples with GPS. I mean, the GPS is the since it's the oldest system, is the one which has been the most manipulated. And one example is these kids in the university in a university in Texas. Who, which actually took over the GPS receiver of a yacht in the Mediterranean and started driving the yacht around. And it took them 24 hours to realize that uh, uh, even they were, they, they were not heading where they thought they were heading because they, they were just uh, uh, to, uh, I mean, surfing around in the middle of the, of the ocean. So uh, it takes a while to understand when your data are being spoofed. And that's why actually the US Defense uh, Department choose to uh, create a spoofing device on GPS rather than a, a strict uh, denial. So the same thing can happen in, in Earth observation. If you start sending Earth observation data, if you can hack the data, manipulate the data and AI will be extremely efficient to manipulate the data in a totally invisible manner. You can remove objects from the image, which could be the target of the observer. You can also create images in the, uh, in the image, create targets or features in the image which do not exist and which will completely uh, ruin the uh, the business of the people using the data so integrity is uh, is probably uh, it's more uh, vicious 
because you don't know that your data have been uh, have been spoofed, have been manipulated, uh, and that that the integrity is uh, is at stake. And, and then you may be doing wrong things based on fake information or let's say uh, manipulated information. Okay, as to the the Leo thing. Uh, it's not really an issue because you can track a satellite and you can you can do use the, the the ten minutes of visibility or the twenty minutes of visibility to do whatever hacking uh, you wish to do. But I guess it's it is, it's the time probably to make a point here. Uh, space systems they're open to attacks because of the many communication links they have. I mean, every time you have a, a radio link, mm -hmm. you're exposed. And that's why our telephones and computers are so fragile. Uh, and of course, on the satellite system, you have the link for operation, maintenance, uh, uh, orbit, uh, and then you have the link for data download, and then you have the inter-satellite communication, and you may have uh, many others. So there are plenty of uh, entry points. But that, which makes the um, uh, the, uh, the space system extremely vulnerable. But at the same time, a, a space system by construction is fairly proof to a cyber attacks precisely because it, it is distributed. If you look a little bit at the, the, the way uh, cyber experts recommend to, uh, to act in order to prevent attack, this, they, they recommend to have a distributed system mm -hmm. rather than having all your assets in the same place. If you can distribute your assets in different places, provided that each place is sufficiently secured, the distributed system with individual security is more difficult to attack. Uh, and and this is exactly what we have with, with the space system. But it means that center of operation has to be secured, the satellite has to be secured, the telemetry stations have to be secured, the terminals from the users have to be secured. That's all these um, secure distributed securities, and that's where SISEC, the company which is uh, organizing this uh, this conference uh, tomorrow and the, in the following day, yes. is 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 providing a solution because uh, SISEC is part of the Confidential Computing Consortium, which is really targeting this distributed system security, uh, which is exactly what what space is. So maybe we'll talk more about it at the end. Oh, but uh, that's uh, so space is open to attacks through uh, radio communication uh, links and uh, it's it has a structure which is prone to very good um, distributed computing uh, security uh, on it and by the way optical communication which i mentioned earlier is exactly the kind of thing which will reduce the vulnerability because it's very easy to uh, to uh, to hijack uh, a radio communication system. An optical communication system is much more difficult. You don't see it because it's uh, you can't hear it if you're not in the beam. Since it's mostly at 1550 nanometers, it's invisible. And if you're not in the beam, you can't get the data. So it's it's going to be much more secure by construction. But absolutely. I'm being too long here. I, yeah, no problem at all. I mean, <laughs> these are all absolute important things, and um, I thought we talk about these solutions at the at the end to get out get us out of these dark forests and uh, depressing our thoughts here. Apo, by the way, depressing things. Uh, let's talk about new space here. I mean, um, we have all these young new companies coming into the market, want to encounter the world and, and want to fly to the moon and whatever. So why are they or are they more vulnerable than the they established are. ones? They are. And they are for a very simple reason, because they outsource everything. I mean, if you if you if you control the construction of your system end to end, and everything is in a, in the same place, it's easy to be secure. But if you do what what any new space company does, which is outsource the manufacturing, uh, use components of the shelf, 
uh, make software defined missions, uh, and even worse, use ground segment as a service. Companies like Leaf Space is offering ground segment as a service, and we AstroCast we're using Leaf as a as a ground segment because we don't want to recreate it. But the vulnerabilities of Leaf will add to the vulnerabilities of um, of AstroCast. And then you have even worse, you have spacecraft as a service. I mean, there are a number of companies, Loft Orbital in, in Silicon Valley, but the Orbit in Italy, or what's their name, uh, Endurosat in Bulgaria. They offer a platform and you, you bring your, uh, your instrument, you bring your payload, you put your payload on their platform. But then the security of your payload is actually dependent on the security of the platform. So the fact that you're essentially relying on third parties for uh, platform uh, operations uh, and the components and sometimes manufacturing uh, is uh, makes the the whole thing very complicated. And, and that's why sometimes we see, and we've seen that with SISEC, we've seen um, a, a very secure payload, which is uh, installed on, on a platform, which was not controlled by the owners of the payload. The owners of the payload have to come to the launch pad and to load, upload the, uh, the encryption keys at the last minute on the launch pad, because they don't want anyone to have to see those keys before they are being launched. But this is not a very um, efficient mm -hmm. practice. So uh, this, this, this is the complication for new space. I mean, too many players working together. So probably we'll need a standardization in terms of, uh, of cybersecurity there if we want to continue working together. Maybe. No, don't be depressed. Our my, solution. My, uh, <laughs> the question just <laughs> arises on, 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 on my mind to say, hey, what can potentially go wrong? And hey, how might lawyers act on that? Uh, but let's talk about the law component, not, not today, because we're running out of time um, here with our 33 minutes. But let's give us some light or show us some some light uh, and not hopefully not the end of the tunnel with the incoming train here so how can we improve security on well, infrastructure on earth space against that as i said the more we're going to be using optical communication hmm. in free space uh, the more secure we're going to make those uh, communication links because they're going to be extremely difficult to grab even if they are they are encrypted and of course, they can be encrypted with very sophisticated keys. And again, and, and, and this is uh, what quantum key distribution offers, but the limitation of quantum key distribution on fiber disappears when you do quantum key distribution in free space. So that's where, why quantum key distribution from satellites is the future of key distribution. So if you have optical links, which are secured with encryption keys, which have been acquired through quantum key distribution, then you have a safe system and you're all in the optical world. That's why I'm saying optics is going to, uh, to take bigger, bigger, mm -hmm. bigger place in, in space. Uh, is, and is of course, uh, the role? there are many other things. Sorry, is, is, is blockchain playing a role in this uh, in this setup here? Yes, blockchain will by necessity, as I mentioned, we're talking about distributed systems, and distributed system will be uh, I mean will be uh, secured by distributed uh, ledgers, and uh, in other words, uh, blockchain. So yes. Blockchain will have to will play a role in, in space. That that's pretty sure. But again, the the key to this is uh, uh, confidential computing, which means how do you create a virtual environment, which which is provenly secure and distributed? Because long time ago we uh, we had problems with stored data, which could be uh, stolen. Mm -hmm. Now protecting data in storage is easy. Protecting data when they are being transmitted is more difficult, but it's doable. The real problem is protecting data where they are being used, which is called, I mean, distributed computing. And, and this is exactly what this confidential computing consortium is trying to achieve. All the big players in the, in the IT world are part of it. SISEC is part of it. And all this we're gonna be discussing 
at the SISAT conference uh, tomorrow and the following days. That's wonderful that you mentioned that you helped to design this conference. Um, and I mean, besides the fact that you're driving over to the wonderful uh, Davos or in a few minutes. So why is this conference so important now? Well, I guess in the, uh, over these 33 minutes, I, I at least indicated reasons why it is important that we address the, uh, I mean, we address these questions. The questions are real. I'm convinced. I hope I've convinced uh, all uh, our participants today. Now we need to find the solutions. And the solutions are a bit more complicated than the simple things I've uh, described here. And the purpose of a uh, CISAT is to uh, bring together experts in cybersecurity and in space uh, and discuss a little bit of depth uh, what could be the solutions, what could be a, a resistant, solid uh, uh, solutions to, uh, to respond to these problems. So essentially, there's going to be instead of 33 minutes, it's going to be three days, but instead of uh, having two incompetent people, it's going to be uh, uh, hundreds of uh, experts uh, talking together. And uh, hopefully we'll, uh, I guess, uh, there's at least one incompetent uh, person <laughs> to me here. But uh, uh, that's the, the purpose of CISAT is really to bring them together and to do it in Europe. Because there was, there is a cybersecurity for satellite conference in the in US, but it's mostly driven by the Department of Defense in the, in the US. And it's important that the Europeans have their own forum to discuss those cybersecurity for space issues. And this is exactly what we're trying to uh, provide with uh, CISAT. So hopefully this, this, uh, this, this is gonna be sufficiently successful that we can uh, have another CISAT in 22 and hopefully we'll be able to meet there. I'm just ignoring the, the other comment. So um, <laughs> um, as you are talking or also, or as you're leading a panel, not you're just talking, are about investments on the size of 21. How do you see the current presence of VCs in, in space startups here in Europe, potentially? Well, we've, we've discussed that together, Torsten, already. And I told you, I find it disappointing. And uh, uh, I'm realizing after uh, five years, we're, we're working with them uh, with the, through different startups and different uh, investment funds that it is very difficult for a standard VC to invest in space like it is to invest in any kind of infrastructure because you essentially have to pour millions in the system before you start collecting revenues. So people in space are familiar with that. VCs are not, and there are many ratios and many boxes which are not ticked by space, uh, uh, space uh, project. So if you make a, a, a real analysis of where VCs and private uh, equity has been invested in space, you realize that it's always together with the government. Either the government has been co-investing with the VCs or the government, like with SpaceX, the, the government has guaranteed enough uh, turnover, enough business for the company. And without the contract of the DOD and NASA, SpaceX would not be where it is. It's not the money from the investors which had made SpaceX. It's the contract from the governments. And, and, um, and in, in Luxembourg, the Luxembourg government is co-investing. Now the European Investment Fund is co-investing with VCs. In, 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 um, in, uh, in England, uh, the uh, Seraphim is essentially loaded with government money from, uh, from the Bank of England. And, and so a pure VC investment in a space project, I don't think there are many. And it's a, it's a bit of a disappointment. So now we're talking about SPACs. It seems that mm. SPACs is the new thing which is hitting space. But uh, at my age, uh, SPACs remind me of uh, Michael Milken and uh, junk bonds. Junk bonds were, was something which was created in the 80s by, by Burnham, Brexel, Lambert, uh, which was a bank by then. And the king of junk bonds was uh, Michael Milken, who was like the Elon Musk of that time in the 80s. In the 90s, he went to jail and spent 10 years in jail. 
So uh, because the whole junk bond became uh, became a, a scam. So I'm really concerned about those SPACs inviting everything because uh, I mean they get there's huge uh, huge revenues for those who are I mean mm. for the uh, the promoters of the SPACs. What's the future of the company which have been SPACed is to be seen. Absolutely. Thank you very much. I'm afraid we have to come to an end or even so I would like to continue and we will continue on our, um, um, on Clubhouse. So, but the entire topics of security of, of cyber threats or um, will be have their place in our future space cafes and in our magazine. And again, for all of you uh, that have an interest to hear more about it, we will start the uh, Clubhouse launch now in a few minutes or um, and just search for Space Cafe at 4.45 CET today. Also, uh, Jose will try to be around even while are in the car, but you promise not to drive by yourself. It's, it's no, your autonomous driving. driver who will do that. <laughs> so um, we have a few more um, topics are for you of a few more uh, Space Cafes lined up for the next days. Uh, on Thursday morning, we start 8.30. Um, with the second edition of the Space Cafe Australia by uh, Melanie Jane Ward and her guest will be Michael Davis from the Andrew, um, Andy Thomas Aerospace Foundation. A day later, we will kick off our Space Cafe in the Netherlands by Chiara Munter and Banu Barzingi and they will have Dr. Hilda Steinwitt from Space Application Services as her guest. So my next uh, Tuesday talk will be with Dr. Darren McKnight. And as we stay on space security, I mean, Darren is one of the key figures on space situation and awareness and space traffic management. And that's exactly what I will talk with him about. On Thursday, we have the second edition of the Space Law Breakfast with Stephen Freeland. And this time we have Tanya masson swan and PJ Blunt. Um, in our talk, and I mean, if if we talk about space lawyers globally, I think that is the the creme de la creme that you can find in one one room. So we will do our best to uh, to not not just entertain you, but uh, give you really some um, feedback on what's going on on current topics. So, and on the same day next Thursday, we will have our first Space Cafe Young Global Talent by Marcus Payer, our editor in chief. And his guest will be Michelle Henlon addressing space law to young um, lawyers. And on the 30th end of this month, I will host RT Holamani from the uh, ISOA um, to talk with her about uh, in my uh, 33 minutes. All these events are online on Eventbrite already. As always, we would like to hear your feedback. So please check in with us on Twitter, on Facebook, Facebook or LinkedIn, or just reply to the messages you will get after the, the talks. Don't forget to sign up for our daily or bi-weekly newsletters. And if you like to treat yourself with something special, become a Space Watcher today. Your support will help us. Take your credit card and visit our fan shop at shop.spacewatch.global. And I know, but we need your support to continue our work. So thank you all very much for your interest today. Thank you, uh, thank you Jose for your inspiring talk and being my guest. And thanks again to the entire team behind the scenes for doing their great job week by week. Again, I hope you all will stay safe and stay healthy. And thanks for joining us again. I hope to see you next week. In the meantime, visit our website and follow us on social media. Hope to hear you on Clubhouse in a few moments. Don't forget, become a space watcher. Thank you, Jose. Jose. Thank you, Sorto. Thank you, Dawson. Thank you for inviting me.